Welcome to the April 7th, 2021 meeting of the Asia Pacific Working Group. Um, some people disconnecting. I'll reshare the minutes and you can add your name as you see fit. Um, anything, uh, King or Zhao or Clement, you want to bring up to add to the agenda? <clears throat> uh, I don't know, uh, who put this agenda here? Okay. The, yeah, the Augur Hackathon, that, uh, the last time I was here, I missed the last week. Sorry, I had a thing to, and I just uh, got lost in that process. But um, we, before that, the second meeting before that, we had tried to find a date, but there were a lot of, a lot of holidays and different kinds of, um, there's a, some work from Saturday, things that people were going through. So um, I thought we could try to pick a date for the next Augur Hackathon. <clears throat> and I know Willem, we had started our discussion about uh, designing for contributor things that had a more, uh, inner source kind of center around uh, essentially each platform, each company having a way to contribute to the map for contributors. Um, but there are other things we can do in an Augur Hackathon. So I'm just, uh, are there dates? What are some dates in April or May that would work for that? I know last weekend there were some conflicts. Uh, so we just, uh, we didn't get to schedule another one. And I don't know if we want to, or if there's another way. So are there, are there, are there, are Saturday still a good day? What Saturday would be good? Um, April 24th, uh, May 1st. We can move that to the later in the agenda too, if people need time to think about that. So, so sorry, uh, Shia, I, I'm sorry, my, my internet is not stable. So uh, I'm, um, uh, do you, do you mean you want to, to pick the date? Uh, we, we must uh, decide which date to hold the hackathon. We we don't have to decide now, but um, let's okay. schedule one far enough in advance that people have a chance to be. I but, think it because the neighbor neighbor state in the uh, I think is the May the first. So we will work on. Uh, April 17th and uh, 24th. So the next two Saturdays we will work, is our work day. Yeah. Uh, what, so, would, so the first and the eighth are work days of May? Uh, May the first is our holiday. Holiday, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a whole nation uh, on holiday mm -hmm. that day. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about a May eighth? May. 8th. I think May eighth uh, is works. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, start. It, it's but it's, it's also our work day. <laughs> oh. Really? Uh, yeah. We borrowed two days from the uh, week. From the holiday, so uh, okay. we will work on the twenty fourth and uh, the the eighty eighth. Yes. Oh yeah. So so we have <laughs> continue five days of holiday. Yeah. Uh, from May first <laughs> to May five. <5th>. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, actually, in China, we yeah. borrow two holidays to. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yeah. How about May, May 15th? Do I hear May 15th? Yeah. 
May fifteenth. Yeah. Fifteen S C K. It's it's works. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Let's let's do that then. And um we'll do the is it ten o'clock in the morning your time still a good time? <clears throat> Uh, sorry. So, so we have now 30 hours before your time. 13 yeah. hours. Yeah, so it'll be 10 a.m. your time, I think 8 p.m. my time. Okay. 8 p.m. Okay, I think 9 o'clock a.m. is uh, available for our 13. Okay, uh, we could do 9 o'clock a.m. That would be just uh, a little earlier for me, which is totally cool. Yeah. So May four, uh, May fifteenth at uh, nine a.m. Yeah, May fifteenth right. nine a.m. Beijing time. Yeah, I think it's right. it's available fast. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, put that on the calendar for now, and we have plenty of weeks between here and there if uh, something changes. So, what's uh, okay? We decided that. Yay. Um, and then a new, um, Elizabeth, I, do you have the new, do you understand the new blog post or know what that is about? I haven't seen that before. Yeah, I, I didn't add this, but this is the one we mentioned at the community call yesterday. Okay. Um, it's Shoya's uh, blog post that she posted about the, um, the digital insight report, which was yeah. super fascinating. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing that, Shoya. That was awesome to put that on our blog and we tweeted it this morning as well so um wow. if there are other there are other things we need to do to help promote that on our end like on the you know north american end or whatever let me know um but i i'm assuming that you're gonna promote it on your channels over there right uh yes okay and if you have any interest or any questions with regard to this report, the content of this, this report. And um, I, I, I just think we may have some, we may, there are some sceneries <laughs> yeah. um, on this, um, because um, this is also related to some metrics, but more, more, um, more related to mathematic models something like that. Oh, and um, we are thinking of uh, to make the whole report automated, autom automated. Um, and, automated um, periodically. Yeah, automated, yes, uh, mm -hmm. you, um, because uh, the those um, those analyses we can separate them into different components, um, and generated uh, automatically generated uh, the the graphs because we have data. Um, uh, currently, we uh, we store all the coordination GitHub data um, at, uh, into ClickHouse database. And we are thinking maybe we, uh, because I've um, I've saw the um, community report produced by Kios, uh, two of which are generated by Augur, and we think they are fascinated. And um, we may think enough um, to augmented uh, generated uh, to, just to go through the whole process. But but we will claim that the idea is from Augur and Grimola. Oh. Excellent. Yeah, and I will show the, well, I will show the results once we get the whole process done. That sounds exciting. So you, are you build, you're building a piece of software that will do this kind of community report automatically for all GitHub communities? 
or yes if the if if the process works i think that could be work for all, all the repository because uh we 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 store all the coordination data like from the global github data we have pulled the global github data uh, it's from gh archive the project and we uh, yes, the data we get is from GH Archive. Let me find the link. I put the link in the chat uh, and that's where we get the GitHub coordination data. Where do you get the GitHub coordination data? Uh, from GH Archive, where I put the link in the chat. Ah, okay, yeah, GH Archive. <clears throat> Yeah, I know historically we've looked at GH Archive and a few other tool builders have. I don't know what its current status is. Back, I don't know, was it, I think it was Open Source Summit Europe 2017, maybe that, maybe 2018, but I think 2017 that we, at that time, GitHub Archive had a lot of holes in the data, but presumably they've closed some of those holes. So, especially the last four years should be more complete and high quality data. Yeah, and this keep updating uh, each day. Yep. And are there any other links that uh, you want to share about this, Joya? Um, I think that's all for now. Okay, great. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see these reports. <laughs> okay, I will share. I will share the result later. Yeah, yeah, of course. So do we have any other thing to discuss <laughs> on this topic? I don't, I don't think so. When the um, figure four, four on the first blog, blog post, um, the quadrant of data and artificial intelligence under the Linux foundation. So this is interesting. So I see translation is on the agenda. Um, I'm not sure what uh, what we need to talk about that. It just as ongoing, we'll continue reviewing the evolution working group. Yeah, it's actually from uh, the, the, the last meeting Matt talked about because the translated metrics are definitely need to be reviewed. Um, uh, but 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 I'm not sure if we. Uh, we have uh, ex expected um, time point to publish the translated metrics, but, but we decide to review um, maybe one working uh, metrics under one work, work group. So we, I just, I just put the agenda here to say that we are reviewing the metrics in evolution working group. 
Okay, fantastic. I don't know if, um, yeah, I will probably need to check with Matt on the timing for the um, translated uh, metrics from this past release. I'm assuming he sent it along to the third party that we use to do the first kind of first pass of the metrics. Um, but I, I can double check with him just to make sure that that's happening. Because when you, Shoya, when you all are reviewing those um, per working group, you're just looking at anything that's maybe changed. Is that right? Not any new metrics? No, just uh, anything that's are not so, not look so good, so fluent. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Do we have anything else to talk about on the agenda? We, there's nothing else on the agenda, but if there's other things that we wanna discuss, we can. Yeah, I think I, I made a new mat matrix uh, about the neighbors and tax last week. So did you want to refer it? Yeah, I do have a link. What'd you call it? Yeah. Neighbor, neighbors and tax? Yeah, what? I'm gonna be hearing it right, but I'll type it in here. It's called neighbors. Is this, is this what you said? Neighbors and tax. Yeah, I can. You can edit the back. Links. Okay. okay. Yeah, I put the links in the chat box. Oh, do we have a metric? I remember uh, in yeah. DI working group called issue tracker or issue label. I'm not sure. It's in the um, evolution. Yeah, yeah, Augur actually generates issue labels and pull request labels, uh, a record, not only of the final labels, but the labels as they are added and removed over time. So you can also see uh, label trajectory. Um, a lot of people, they, they create the pull request and then they add issues or they add labels over later and remove labels. And this, uh, that's even more common with issues. So we can get that out of Augur now for sure. Yeah. I've been doing that in the risk working group for a year or two. Yeah, and I I find something very interesting in uh, some communities like uh, the Kubernetes. Uh, and in, the, in this community, they use the robot to make some neighbors or tax yeah yeah so i think there's uh there's another question about the community uh, actions like uh how many metrics about the uh, human in the community and how many metrics about the robots so we can see that robot acts a very important role in the community nowadays so i think that's uh, we should try to make some metrics for uh, the robot to do something. Or... Yeah, and there's, yeah. I, I don't know what other um, groups are doing with the robots, but I've actually talked with the Kubernetes and LF CNCF folks about this. And so these labels, because we, Kate Stewart and I have done some analysis of these labels in the risk working group. And the, the labels that are prefaced with SIG slash that those are all the robots are doing there is uh, yeah. identifying which working group or special interest group inside of a very large project might pay attention to this. 
So I don't know how the bot works, but I'm guessing it's using some kind of computational linguistic or social network algorithm to make a guess about which working group or special interest group to assign this to or to label this with. And so it's yeah. um, those are interesting because they serve a slightly different purpose than other labels. Um, some labels, a lot of labels indicate what part of the system or the level of urgency uh, associated with it or whether it's a good new first time contributor issue. So labels have a lot of different purposes. And the interesting thing about the bot labels I've seen is, is that and I haven't, I'm sure there are bot labels that do other things, but this automatic kind of work group assignment role is, is what I see the bots doing with issue labeling a lot, um, at least in the data we've gathered so far. So it's worth, it's worth considering the role of the bot, but also the purpose of the bot, which is pretty easily discernible from what the label is in the context of the repository. Yeah, so uh, the Microsoft makes a, a very interesting project about a robot to uh, to assign neighbors uh, automatically uh, in their uh, donut projects. Donut projects, did you say? Yeah, donut projects. Oh, donut, yeah. Yeah. So they used uh, uh, no, not uh, maybe yeah ML .net. So for neighbors. Sorry, I just yeah. I can't remember the project names. Maybe the outer neighboring. Uh, let me think. <laughs> so what are we looking for here? What is the... Um, we're just looking at uh, label. We've been discussing label assignments and the work that Kate Stewart and I had done with the risk working group and how some labels that are assigned by bots are assigned based on uh, a comp some kind of machine learning algorithm that looks at what special interest group inside of CNCF on that project would be interested in it. And um, right now, Clement is showing us uh, that in there's another mechanism. So in the analysis Kate and I did, the most common bot assigned labels were these special interest groups um, that were assigned by bots. And <clears throat> Clement is showing us the um, way that .NET is using machine learning to assign uh, some different collection of classified labels as well. So what's the, is the hope to develop 
metrics or insights? What's the hope in kind of following this thread? I think it's very exploratory at this point. I, th I think there's a desire to understand or distinguish between bot assigned labels and the labels assigned by a person. And it had begun with a discussion that uh, Augur collects not just a label at the end of a issue or pull request life cycle, but how those labels change over the course of the life cycle. So especially on issues, labels are assigned um, and removed as the label goes through a process. They, they are like static one-time assignments. So why do we care? Like what's the point of caring about label reassignment? Or whether or not that label, or whether or not that label comes from a bot or a human. I think Clement's getting to that. Um, yeah, uh, I think um, uh, the label is the I think the is the new feature for the uh, some GitHub projects. Uh, we uh, like in China, some kind of projects that don't, don't need uh, don't label the issue to uh, classify the issue. So. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, when the newcomers to the co uh, community, they don't know how to uh, participate in the issue process. So I think a neighbor is a very important thing to classify the issues and help the newcomers. Um, but the assign the neighbors is a lot of work for the uh, developers. So um some um, how some kind of projects that uh, made the robot to do these things uh, like the donuts and the way we'll um, use the technique to the some uh, Chinese projects like the my sport uh, they use the uh, issue neighbor robot to assign neighbors but uh, one way um, uh, that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting question because we, uh, when we uh, think about the uh, developers, the apps also are humans, not the robots. But uh, there are more and more uh, things in the community that are made by the robots. So we, uh, I think we we can make make the contribute contribution uh, uh, differs from the human or the robot. I think the metrics will uh, maybe can do these things. Okay, so is the, cause we do have one currently developed metric, which is, I think it's called issue label inclusivity, which is about trying to understand how projects label issues to be more inclusive to newcomers. Um, I don't have it handy right in front of me, but it is a released metric. Oh, yeah, put it in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, yep, thanks. And so, Clement, is your is the hope to start differentiating between labels that are created, trying to understand labels that are created by people versus bots? Is that? Uh, not only the labels, like the comments. Uh, okay. Uh, also, the uh, make uh, maybe the PRs PRs from the robots. Or we can uh, then we can think the uh, the product productivity of the uh, mm -hmm. of the robots or the human are different, very very different. So uh, maybe we can see uh, uh, we we can measure the amount of the issue of PR in a project when we uh, try to uh, compare to projects about the issues or the uh, PRs uh, but uh, but one project used the robot but the other is not so we can the huge differences between the productivity gotcha so would a metric in this case really just be about differentiating, say, the volume of bot activity in a project at the very base level? We, we haven't talked about this as a metric ever, right? Differentiating human activity from not human activity. 
Um, and we've not always in, just not in, well, and yeah, not in this working group, but we've we've discussed it in risk, and I think in yeah, I think, well, risk. I know it's been discussed. I, I feel like there's been other places that it's been discussed. Okay, I'm looking. It doesn't look like it's made it to like metric state. You know what I mean? Like into that, even that spreadsheet. No, it's it's been up to this point um, an, an analysis to see what the metric would be. Like what what do we learn from it? Okay. I think the tags are proposed as a risk metric somewhere. The tags themselves, perhaps not the bot distinction. Yeah. So what? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so we can see that the Microsoft, uh, the Donut project of the Microsoft used the issue neighbor as a robot to uh, assign the neighbors, uh, assign the neighbors in the project. And so there are one, two, three, four, so eight, uh, maybe eight, eight, eight projects. They use the uh, robot. So I was taking notes. I so I mean I could see how if we start kind of differentiating bot activity. I mean there there are metrics out there like time to first response, which could be heavily skewed if we're not filtering. Because I look at like the badging program that we have, right? And if somebody posts an issue in the badging program, Matt Snell obviously created a bot that just says thanks for your application. We'll get yeah. to it soon. Yeah. Um, so, th so the time to first response is like less than five minutes, just because the bot takes care of it. So, uh, I, this is kind of interesting, and I don't think we've ever really tried to incorporate that. I'm Don. Do you mind if I ask you a question? <laughs> do, do you does VMware differentiate bot traffic from human traffic? Uh, yeah. Okay. I well, because because most of the metrics that I care about, I think like like response time, and I don't care that a bot responded right away. What I yeah. care about is that a human eventually responds. Yeah. So, for example, for that metric, I filter out as many of the bots as I can find. Um, so I have like a just a big list of things that are filtered out of the Augur query for known bots. I mean, I'm honestly wondering if something like this would be a common metric because this could be a filter in many scenarios. Yeah. I'm only thinking about this now for the first time in like five or 10 minutes. So maybe that's not the appropriate place, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be happy to, to work on it within the common working group if it doesn't, if it doesn't fit anywhere else. Yeah, I think it fits in common because it works everywhere else. <laughs> Because <laughs> issues, uh, uh, I'm trying to think like diversity for value is certainly looking at digital data that's from the platform. So labels matter, matter there. Um, <clears throat> risk and evolution both have an interest in it. So I mean, I think all the other digital trace data focused working groups have a interest in, in them. So probably it, it fits really nicely under commons. Or common. All right, I'm slowly, I'm capturing this in these minutes and I'm gonna go put it in the common, just as a thought that we could talk about next week. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm not going to talk for like two minutes while I, while I yeah. do this. <laughs> so if you're <laughs> waiting for me to say something, I'm not going to.
So yeah, I mean, I think I'm good with an action item of, of Don sort of taking up the definition of tags as a, it, it becomes a filter on a lot of metrics, but I think the general understanding of the use of tags um, in different repo areas is, is a common thing because there's a couple of questions about bots uh, doing assignments because that's what really when you're putting it in a special interest group that's an assignment oriented bot tag and i think uh the, the point that that uh, is being made here <clears throat> is is that uh there are other purposes for these bots to be for these bots to assign things um so we haven't really figured out what all bots do has anybody seen a bot unassign a label to an issue and then reassign something based on where that issue is? I haven't seen a bot unassign. I've only seen a bot assign. But that okay. my view, <laughs> my view think, of the data. I think some of the Kubernetes bots can unassign things. OK. But I'm not 100%. <clears throat> Yeah, well, they can def the bots will definitely unassign things because all of almost all of the assignments actually go through the bots. But the question is whether a human told them to unassign it. Right. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I sort of think that some of the Kubernetes bots can unassign things. Okay. But I'm not positive. Because that seems like kind of a different scenario than like just the general responding bot, like, hey, you mm -hmm. haven't signed a contributor agreement, don't forget, <laughs> you need to go do that first. Like those are kind of pro forma comments and like labels seem much more systematic. <laughs> they seem more thoughtful <laughs> in terms of like where something is in a workflow. Yeah. Okay, well, I've got it on the common agenda. Um, I did have something just in the last six minutes. I know this had come up last time. There's a, I don't have the name for it, but a Chinese Google summer of code. <laughs> the only yeah. thing I have for it. And, and um, there was a request that maybe, let's see who could take a look. Willem and I discussed that during the first Augur hackathon, and we were going to try to do some work with contributors under that program. Okay. I just, I was going to say, if there's something, yeah, if we can do to help in that submission process, please let us know. Like if there's text that you need that we kind of reuse <clears throat> for Google Summer of Code, there's a lot of like kind of standard boilerplate text that we use for a lot of our programs. And if you'd like that, I can share that document pretty easily. Or I could even just put it in the minutes here. Let me go track it down. I think William may know more about this. Um, I, I can ask him the um, like uh, what the process is now after the meeting. That'd be helpful, Shoya. And then just let him know that if he needs a hand, he can contact me or Elizabeth or Sean to help provide text that would help in the application. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. All right. And then a um, couple other things. Uh, Shoya, do you, are you comfortable? You know what you're doing with the Google season of docs. You got that email from Venu. Yeah. Just make sure you're okay there. Yeah. Um, I, I know I need to create a statement, but I haven't read uh, very carefully about the documentation of Google season of docs. Okay. Okay. Um, well, as you have questions, again, don't hesitate let yeah. us know. Um, gosh, I have all these like small items. I was like, King, this, thank you for helping with the sweatshirts. Yeah, those were awesome. 
we're ordering more because they were amazing. So <laughs> yeah, uh, so let me update the process of the sweatshirt. So I can connect uh, to the vendor, the supplier, uh, and uh, they will give you the plan and uh, documentation to email to you and uh, quotation, quotation to you. And uh, yeah. yeah. That sounds perfect. And we, what I'll try to do is just work with the Linux Foundation to invoice directly that way. I'd rather do that than a reimbursement of any sort. So, okay. That would be good. Okay, cool. Thank you for doing that, King. Like I said, they were probably the, <laughs> the most well received <laughs> sweatshirt that I've ever yeah. seen. But everybody really liked them. So, so uh, I think uh, summer will come. Summer will come. We need to book. Uh, we need to make the T-shirt <laughs> like this. <Huh>. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Cool. So, do, right. do do you do you inject the vaccine? I I heard uh, uh, there's some news. Uh, the China China will open to the overseas uh, almost in July or August, August and July um, almost. And uh, if some someone who have injected the vaccine, uh, they have uh, they can come to China. I am done. The, yeah, the uni university helps. Yeah, I'm regard. done as well. Yeah, we, we have done too. Yeah, Clement has done. <laughs> so that'd be great. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I'm not just going anywhere other than this room. <laughs> so I think maybe we can uh, consider the chaos con in Asia, in China, or other in Europe, uh, Chaos Con in Europe, yeah, in North we had, America. Yeah. We had talked about Chaos Con with Don here. So I mean, I think as soon as things start opening up, we're pretty um, uh, like flexible to, to get a Chaos Con up and running again. I think we know the process pretty well at this point. And so we're all just kind of as a community waiting for people to be able to, one, travel to different countries yeah. and then Two would really just travel themselves like comfortably. I'm pretty sure there's going to be kind of an emotional, uh, psychological thing that we're all going to have to get over as well. So, but for a ChaosCon Asia, is if we could tie it to one of the other Linux Foundation China events, that would be that would be helpful. Either KubeCon or Open Source Summit, or maybe those are combined. Maybe those are the same same time. But that would be yeah. helpful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, is Open Source Summit, I remember that being in the summer as well, in Open Source Summit Asia, isn't it? Uh, I don't know, uh, Open Source Summer, uh, I don't know. I feel like it's always been after the end of our academic year, but I could be remembering something else. I think now all bets are off because everything's moved around. Yeah. So if that's over the summer, OSS Summit in uh, Asia would be in a, a really great place. We've partnered with OSS summits for chaos cons before. And those, it's gone really well because you've got a large crowd of metric curious people. And, and so we get an opportunity to share what we're, the work that we're doing and how it can be useful with a much larger population than if, if it's a standalone event or associated with a smaller event. Although KubeCon is probably as big as OSS summits. It's actually the same. I just looked. So um, here's the their events page. But it's so so in China they combine KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, and Open Source Summit into one event. But it's currently listed as to be announced. So they haven't actually set a date for, which means it won't be in the summer. I think the only the only Asian events that I can see on their schedule are the the ones. Uh, oh, actually, those don't have dates either, the Tokyo events. Yeah, yeah those don't have dates. I would be surprised if they do. I would be surprised if they do an event in China this year, given that they haven't announced the dates yet, and these take a long time to plan. I'm going to guess it's going to be 2022. 
Uh, and it looks like they, they did put a date and a place uh, limit. The LF member summit is going to be in November this year in Napa. And that's normally in March. So they pushed that yeah. to accommodate the fact that we haven't had one for two years. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think the answer is yes. Let's figure out a way to make this happen. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> once, once things open up. All right, we are at the end of time, everybody. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Yep. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Good action items. Talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.